Happy Thursday, everybody. Here's what's coming up tonight on now. What's with all the earthquakes? Oh, all right. I'm all right. There's been a lot of them in a short amount of time, though. Chris Costa, take a look at what is going on. Plus, the experts will have their opinions, but what are the most bizarre ways to predict the outcome of the Super Bowl? We'll find out. And now gets a job. You want to be a game warden? We'll talk about that. This is New Center Now. and shook beneath our feet, although you probably didn't feel it. Hello, everyone. I'm Lindsay Mills. And I'm Lee Goldberg. There have been seven earthquakes in or around our state in the last week alone, which is crazy for us. Geolog Geological Survey confirmed two minor earthquakes happened yesterday within an hour of each other. That was just yesterday morning. That's right. Nothing dangerous, but it all is just a little strange. So, of course, we were talking to you about this, and you asked us to find out why the ground is on this shaking streak. So of course we took your questions to the experts. All right, so Chris Costa played our geologist for the day and tried to get to the bottom of this. So everything we need to know, right? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> I, did, I did my best. I did actually speak to the director of the Maine Geological Survey. He's the, the state geologist for all of Maine. Uh, so we brought a lot of your questions and now we have some answers. Most people don't think Maine, you know, we shouldn't have earthquakes. This is an exciting week for Dr. Robert Marvini. It's actually one of the fun part of my job. The state geologist has been busy analyzing data for eight earthquakes so far this new year. The plate doesn't move smoothly. It moves in little jerks, and we feel those as earthquakes. Maine is not in an earthquake-prone area. It sits in the middle of a tectonic plate, but Maine still sees its fair share like a 2.3 magnitude quake in Harrison Wednesday. It felt like uh, a collapse of the wood, and that's what I thought it was. Buildings actually shake in, in even those small events. It's something people should pay attention to, because we could have, we had a magnitude 4 uh, in 2012. We could have another one of those in a decade or so. And, uh, you know, those can cause damage in a home. Geologists say Maine averages about 20 earthquakes a year, but they're usually pretty small, not bigger than 2.6 in magnitude. They say the rumbling usually only lasts a couple of seconds, like dropping a penny into a bowl of water. You had questions too, so we asked the state geologist. I know there was a rumor going around that the plant was built on a fault line. Is this the same fault line that's being active right now? And so there's no relationship between those old mapped faults and the earthquakes that we see today. Ever since the major Japan earthquake, with a shift in the plates, there has been an increase in frequency. I found that there's really no change in the incidence of minor through major earthquakes around the globe. Hmm, the volcano in the Philippines is blowing up, and at the same time, the Northeast is having earthquakes. Coincidence? I think not. It's a, it's a coincidence. Geologists are still studying why these clusters of quakes happen. It's not indicating that there's some instability, new instability in the crust. It's just that it, 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 it's just the matter of randomness. Sometimes they come together and sometimes they don't. Obviously, Maine does get some more intense earthquakes. You guys remember that one back in 2012 in the Hollis Buxton area that registered as a four. Uh, but when I spoke to the state geologist today, he said usually Maine averages an earthquake that's three or higher about once a year. It's an average. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's obviously with the frequency of it. And this last week, everybody's like, what's going on around here? Because it's not something we're used to having. So, yeah. All right, geologist Chris Costa checking that. it out. Speaking of shaking things up. That's Let's get our first look at the forecast with Jess Conley. <laughs> yeah, Jess is still rocking the Crocs, but she's also sporting a different look today. <laughs> Jess, is that right? Yeah, we have some new graphics to show you guys. Pretty excited uh, about this. Hopefully it looks cleaner and nice uh, presentation for you. Let's talk about today. High temperatures were pretty uh, low. We made it into the upper teens and lower 20s today. 18 the high today in Augusta, Bangor. Only made it to 17 degrees. Portland only to 24. That was about it. It does stay chilly as we get into the day tomorrow, but by this weekend, we're going to warm up quite a bit. We're talking 40s for Saturday and Sunday. Taking a look right now at the current wind chills. Look at this. 20 below is what it feels like right now in Greenville. Feels like zero in Millinocket. One below in Bangor. 
17 degrees is what it feels like in West Cassett. So not too bad, depends on where you are. Uh, the colder the temperature is, just a slight wind can make these wind chills feel much cooler. Seven is what it feels like currently in Calais, and these are the current wind speeds. Most of us, anywhere from about 10 to 20 miles an hour right now, it'll stay breezy into tonight as well, and we do have some wind chill advisories. We'll get those in just a minute. Wind gusts up to about uh, 20 to 30 miles an hour, so again, staying breezy tonight. Here are your wind chill advisories. These are from the National Weather Service. These are actually in effect until tomorrow morning, and it will be a chilly start to the day. Uh, mostly clear skies right now, and temperatures will be able to cool off even more tonight, guys. So get ready for a chilly start to your Friday morning. All right, Jess, thanks so much for that. Fallout continues from the sentencing of former USA Gymnastics team Dr. Jeffrey Nasser. The president of Michigan State University resigned last night. Nasser, who was employed by MSU, pleaded guilty to seven counts of first degree criminal sexual conduct involving more than 156 girls and women over more than two decades. Now, victims of sexual assault across the world, including right here in Maine, are hoping that this high profile case can be the beginning of some real change. I just signed your death warrant. The high profile sentencing hearing of former USA Gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser came to an end yesterday when a Michigan judge sentenced him to up to 175 years in prison for criminal sexual conduct after more than 150 of Nasser's victims spoke out. When the judge read his sentence, she didn't hold back. As much as it was my honor and privilege to hear the sister survivors, it is my honor and privilege to sentence you. Because, sir, you do not deserve to walk outside of a prison ever again. Word of the sentence and the condemnation that came with it spread quickly. I think those words will resonate with those survivors and hopefully with others. Melanie Sachs is the executive director for Sexual Assault Response Services of Southern Maine. She says while the words from the bench were powerful, watching the survivors unite in relief and validation left a lasting impression. Where the women were able to hug one another, comfort one another, validate one another's stories afterwards because the impact of having publicly told your story is going to continue. You are pathetic to think that anyone would have any sympathy for you. Massachusetts native Allie Raisman is a three-time gold medal winning Olympian who spoke out strongly at Nasser's sentencing hearing, but she's not done there. Raisman spoke this morning to the Today Show. And it's not something where you just instantly feel better. Yeah. Um, you know, we need to hold these organizations accountable. USA Gymnastics, United States Olympic Committee, MSU, they need an independent investigation. This is bigger than Larry Nasser. Uh, we have to get to the bottom of how this disaster happened. If we don't figure out how it did, we can't be confident that it won't happen again. And Allie Raisman added that in her opinion, the United States Olympic Committee also has to be held accountable for all of this and that for far too long, the organization has put money and medals ahead of the health and wellness of its athletes. All right, so we here are right now are no longer friends with Alexa. <laughs> hey Alexa, who will win the Super Bowl? I'm rooting for the Eagles. Alexa, Alexa, everyone knows you should bet on Brady, but in case you're unsure, there are a few weird ways to predict a Super Bowl winner. That's next. Coming up on 207, we are in David Turin's kitchen. What are we cooking? Well, we're going to make some uh, salmon seared with some mussel ragu. Sounds good. That's on 207 at 7. Uh, anybody who's not a trader in Maine will obviously be rooting for the Patriots in the Super Bowl a week from Sunday. And the odds makers are already busy predicting the outcome, with the Patriots right now looking like the team to beat. But not everyone is in their corner. Tennyson Coleman is looking into some of the ways fans sum up the odds. Hey, Tennyson. Hey, how's it going, guys? I thought it might be interesting to check in with a few of my inside sources so I did what many of us do these days when we want information. Check it out. Hey Alexa, who will win the Super Bowl? I'm rooting for the Eagles. They've never won a Super Bowl, and I like a good underdog story. Ooh, that's not what Patriots fans want to hear heading into the big game. But let's see what Siri says. Siri, who will win the Super Bowl? Apparently, the odds favor the Patriots over the Eagles by five points. Pats fans, that sounds much better, doesn't it? 
Another method many fans use to predict the winner is the Madden NFL gameplay simulation. Each year, EA Sports releases the game's pick right before the Super Bowl. The game has gotten it right all but once when it comes to the last six Patriots Super Bowls, even predicting the actual final score in New England's 28-24 win over Seattle three years ago. In the last 14 seasons, including games that the Patriots did not play, Madden has gotten the Super Bowl prediction right 71% of the time. And one last thing, NFL Research tweeted this, saying, no quarterback has ever led the league in passing yards and won the Super Bowl that same season. Even this year's leading passer, Tom Brady, couldn't escape the 51-year-old curse 10 years ago. He led the league in passing in the 2007-2008 season, but lost in the Super Bowl against the Giants. All right, so aside from that last little tidbit, it looks like even with some of the odds in their favor, it seems the Patriots are not taking any chances. And they might be a little superstitious because the team announced on Twitter they will wear their white away team jerseys despite being the ceremonial home team for the game against the Eagles. Teams that have worn white jerseys have won 12 of the last 13 Super Bowls. Guys? That's a statistic I like to hear. Yeah, I think it's our, we've got it all wrapped up. Tennyson figured it out. We don't have to play the game anymore. I mean, the Patriots are going to win. We'll and let's see. start playing the parade, right? That's all we need. <laughs> like right. always. TBC, thank let's you, Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. <laughs> okay, well, if you want to get paid to enjoy the great outdoors, listen up. you got a good attitude, willing to learn. This could be the job for you. It's the main morning service, and they're hiring. The next installment of Now Hiring coming up. And get ready for a big swing in temperatures. This time it's going up. The full forecast is coming up. The main warden service is looking for seasonal hires. Now as Clay Gordon is seeing what it takes to become a part-time warden. Really, there's no better experience for someone who wants to become a full-time game warden. The wardens are looking for help. Seasonal work to assist with boating patrols on some of Maine's most popular recreational lakes during the beautiful summer months. It's obviously going to behoove a, uh, an applicant to have boating experience. If you're going to go uh, race, race cars, we'd like someone to have their license too. But before you think you're not qualified, Corporal McDonald says if you hunt or fish in Maine, there's a chance you've been around boats, whether it be canoes or other watercraft. If you're looking to become a future warden, it covers the more complicated side of law enforcement work. OUI detection, crash investigation, and if it's a, if it's a serious crash, more than likely it's going to be the full-time game warden that uh, is going to be the primary investigator. This position does not require that you go to the Maine Criminal Justice Academy, but you have to pass a written alert test and physical fitness test. The alert is a essentially a reading comprehension exam. The physical fitness test consists of a run, push-ups, and sit-ups. The length of the run, the amount of push-ups, and sit-ups are all determined by your age bracket, but not everyone gets through it. This is the only portion of the test you get the answers to, and every and 50% of the people don't take advantage of that. Often say that you get to the end of your driveway in the morning, and it quite often will be your choice most every day if you go left or right. And this is your office, this truck, high-speed internet in the truck, and all-terrain vehicles and boats and things to to do your work with and. If you like the outdoors and if you like law enforcement and if you're motivated, you got a good attitude, willing to learn, this could be the job for you. Now the physical fitness and alert tests are good for any law enforcement job in the state, not just the warden service. The fitness test is good for a year. The comprehension test is good for the rest of your life. And if you have a position that is hiring and you want to let us know about it, send it into asknow at newcentermain.com or comment now on the Facebook live stream. And speaking of the Facebook live stream, yes. <laughs> it's just been making us giggle a yeah. lot right now. So please uh, give us some more uh, 
tips for our now hiring segment because yes. right now we have a haha -ha game going on right now. So <laughs> no, no, it don't do like, it. it. You promise don't you do won't it. laugh. I promise. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to just quick while okay, we have it. I know. I told them okay. not to make me laugh. Or okay. I'm not going to be able to okay. keep it together okay. for the weather. Okay. Just take your crocs right. and go over there. Ooh, deep breaths. Current temperatures, on. guys, it's in the upper teens and lower 20s right now. Uh, we just weren't able to warm up today, and it looks like we're going to stay on the chilly side for tomorrow, too. 14 in Bangor, same thing for Augusta right now, 20 degrees right now. In Portland with the wind chill, even colder than that. Uh, this is a look at our current wind chill values. Remember, the wind chill is what it actually feels like on your skin. Greenville 20 below. Make sure you're dressing very warm if you're headed out at all late tonight or early tomorrow. Feels like five in Bar Harbor. Feels like one below right now in Bangor. Feels like four in Augusta and in Lewiston. It feels like nine currently in Portland. So as we go through the overnight hours tonight, wind chills will be chilly right through early tomorrow morning. So again, dress nice and warm uh, for tomorrow. Then it will warm up some and the winds will die down too. So that of course is good news. We don't want it to be dangerously cold. Upper teens and low to mid 20s by tomorrow at dinner time. Uh, watches and mornings in effect or we have wind chill advisories in effect from the National Weather Service are for far northern and western Maine. Again, these are in effect overnight tonight and until tomorrow morning. Clear skies right now mean that things will cool off and it's going to cool off quite a bit as we go through the overnight hours tonight. We call that radiational cooling and we are definitely going to be seeing it. Check out these temperatures again. This is the actual air temperature at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Single digits farther inland at the coast. We're in the very low teens, so it's going to be cold waking up. We will warm up some as we get into tomorrow afternoon, upper teens and low twenties by around lunchtime. And then as we get into tomorrow evening, some of us will make it into the mid twenties, but that's about it. That's a few degrees below normal for this time of year. We're going to warm up much more though as we head into the weekend. So if you're looking for a warm up, just got to wait till Saturday. Look at Saturday morning. We are starting with temperatures anywhere from the mid twenties to the mid thirties at the coast by eight o'clock Saturday morning, 30 already in Portland. It's 22 in Bangor, but watch what happens going throughout the day. We'll have winds coming out of the southwest. That's where all the warm air is. It moves into our area and we'll see high temperatures in the upper 30s and lower 40s for the day on Saturday. Pretty sim similar situation for the day on Sunday as well. Now, the one thing that you'll notice is those clouds will increase, especially Saturday afternoon. We'll see more in the way of cloud cover and then overnight Saturday into early Sunday. You can see it there. A few rain showers, nothing uh, too big. We'll just see some sprinkles, especially closest to the coast. But once we get into a little bit later on Sunday morning, things will dry out, skies will clear up. Here's a look at your marine forecast for tomorrow. Small craft advisory is in place only through five o'clock tomorrow morning, though. Seas around three to five feet. Uh, winds could gust as high as 25 knots at times again through the morning hours tomorrow. Water temperature, a very chilly. 38 degrees right now. All right, let's talk about this seven day forecast again tomorrow. Sunny but chilly temperatures only make it into the mid 20s as we get into this weekend, though. Check out those high temperatures 40 for Saturday. If you're away from the coast, 43 for Sunday. We'll see mostly cloudy skies for the day on Saturday and by Sunday. We'll see a few morning showers, just a slight chance for those. And then as we head into Saturday afternoon, those skies start to clear up. Looking good for the day on Monday, partly cloudy skies, but definitely on the cooler side, high temperatures only in the low 30s. And then we're watching a storm chance as we head into the beginning uh, of next week, Monday night into Tuesday. I think farther away from the coast, it'll be a pretty close miss on that storm, even cooler as we get into the day on Wednesday. If you're at the coast, though, keeping an eye on that storm. A few flakes definitely possible for the day on Tuesday. Again, pretty nice tomorrow and then definitely into the weekend. We'll warm up at the coast. High temperatures make it into the low to mid 40s, but that storm on Tuesday again, I think we'll see a few snow snowflakes from it. Not expecting much in the way of accumulation, but just something to keep an eye on. We have a few days uh, to keep an eye on that as well. Cloudy and warmer as we get into the end of next week. And there's our new seven day. There it is. Yeah. It looks nice. Yeah. Nice and clean and yeah. crisp. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good job. Good. Just good. like the Crocs. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, just a minute ago, Jess gave us a look at the new New Center main weather graphic look. That's right, but coming up at 530, you can get the full effect. Cindy Williams has a preview. Hey, Cindy. Hey, guys. We're really excited here at New Center, Maine today to unveil our new graphics look. We actually had the big unveil at noon. You're going to see it at 30 o'clock as well. It's designed to be keep track of what you're going to see in our newscasts.
From the get-go, our graphics say Maine. Our goal? To feature the things that make our home so special. You'll notice crisp, sharp lines and a cleaner look designed to be more like what you'd see on your phones or online since we bring you the news on those devices as well. A cool new feature to help you navigate our newscasts will periodically tell you about some of the stories in queue that we think will be of interest to you. Those are on the right side of your screen and are in order, bottom to top. And this is Maine, so scenic, so gorgeous, and we're going to highlight that every day through beautiful photography. So we hope you'll keep sending in your pictures of what makes Maine so special in your eyes. So looking forward yes. to that. So many people have been working so hard to make it look so beautiful. So thing. yeah, a lot of hard work's gone into that. So right. I can't wait to see it. We're almost done, but we'll be back with more now. Right after this. Well, we think the best part of our show is that we get to answer your questions. And so one of you had a question for Keith Carson, who's on vacation this week, but we did not let him go away without at least taping the answer to this mountainous question. Got a great viewer question the other day. How come Mount Washington's weather is so extreme, especially when compared to a city like Denver? Well, let's start with elevation. Mount Washington is 6,300 feet or so above sea level, which makes it the highest peak to the east of the Mississippi. But Denver is famously 5,280 feet, so it's about a 1,000 foot difference, but that still doesn't account for how much more extreme Mount Washington's weather is. One important factor when you think about topography is something called prominence. Prominence is simply how much higher is one mountain peak compared to the surrounding topography. And in the case of Mount Washington, it is much higher than everything around it, including the other White Mountains, and obviously to the mountains to the east into Maine as well. Another ingredient when you talk about extreme weather at Mount Washington is the weather around it. Take a look at this image, which is of our hashtag bomb cyclone, our big January blizzard. Look where Mount Washington is relative to that storm. All that ocean energy, all these nor'easters can get close to Mount Washington, but they can't get anywhere near a city like Denver. And adding to that is something called upslope precipitation. Because the presidentials sit kind of by themselves there in their height, they squeeze out moisture from storm systems as they move in from the west. That upslope precipitation intensifies the amount of snow, rain, everything on top of Mount Washington. And conversely, Denver is in the complete opposite situation. Because the mountains to their west, Aspen and those areas are so much higher, as it goes downhill, it's downsloping. So actually, Denver's climate is semi-arid. It's almost a desert. All that moisture is being upsloped on the bigger mountains to the west across the Rockies and goes downslope into Denver. Make no mistake, Denver's weather is extreme, but nothing like Mount Washington because of those factors. All right, Keith, that was great. I'm glad he left that little bit for us. So if you've ever wondered, you know, how something works, maybe something sciency that Keith could figure out for you, just let us know right now on our Facebook live stream or reach out to Keith directly on Facebook or by email. We do love those questions and we love to get the answers. That's kind of the whole point, right? Exactly. All right, that does it for us now, but News Center at 530 with the brand new look starts right now.